nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. <laughs>
Unlike the first days when new supply lines were in dire need, today's callers often discuss issues regarding their mental distress with the events of 311. Counselors said the most recent topics range from arguments between spouses over whether to leave Fukushima because of the radiation to the way fathers feel estranged from their families after being forced to move out of the house to find work. A sense of loss and isolation, as well as pessimism about life in general, have recently stood out, the counselors said. Shinichiro Watanabe, 66 years old, who heads the hotline, said, The earthquake and the nuclear accident have affected many Fukushima residents. We will provide consultations to as many people as possible. In a related story, NHK reports that municipal workers from evacuation zones report that the stress of their jobs dealing with anxious and disgruntled citizens and a much heavier workload has 15% of them suffering depression and another almost 10% diagnosed as suicidal which of course gives lie to that very unhappy version of the Farrell Williams song, Happy, the one that highlights how delighted people are to be in Fukushima and see them dancing and prancing around. Well, that story is still in progress, and I will have more to report upon it next week for Nuclear Hot Seat. That's the human side. On the technical side of the issue, Hiroake Koide, professor of Kyoto University Research Reactor Institute, was asked during an interview, what is the current situation of the melted fuel? And Professor Koide replied, nothing has been done. I don't think the melted fuel is sitting in one piece, as TEPCO and the government imagine. Probably many pieces are scattered everywhere in the reactor vessel. For example, there are pieces stuck to the wall, I think. If, for example, they somehow collect 50 pieces of debris, they can't collect the other 50. If many workers are forced to be exposed to radiation to do this ineffective job, I think it's better to just contain it like the Chernobyl sarcophagus. The government says it will take 40 years to decommission, but that is not going to be enough at all. When they finish, I will have been dead for a long time. NHK World reports that to remove fuel debris from damaged reactors, the only other people who have done that kind of work are engineers at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. NHK obtained special permission from the U.S. government to access 1,000 videotapes that recorded engineers removing fuel debris from that plant. William Austin was in charge of the work at Three Mile Island. He thinks the situation at Fukushima is a lot more challenging than Three Mile Island. He said the fuel at Fukushima Daiichi has melted through the reactor cores and has dropped to the bottom of containment. Your orders of magnitude worse, he said. I mean, I can't conceive of how much difficulty you've got. The vessels have many leaks. On top of that, engineers at Fukushima have to deal with three reactors, not just one, like at Three Mile Island. World Nuclear News, the pro-nuclear organization, cheerfully reports that two, count them, two robots are cleaning up contamination inside Fukushima Daiichi 2. The new one is wiping down the walls, while another continues to scrub the floor. But they don't do windows. Mm -mm. No need for transparency wanted or needed at Fukushima Daiichi. World Nuclear News goes on to say the robots are deployed in Unit 2's first floor, the location of the containment vessel hatch that TEPCO needs to inspect. This will require another remote control operation, but access by workers is needed to open the hatch and set up equipment. Ultimately, they write, TEPCO needs to find the status of the reactor core and develop a plan to remove its remains. Ha ha ha! Ya think! World Nuclear News, masters of understatement when it comes to nuclear dangers, disasters, and, of course, catastrophes. Workers at the Fukushima nuclear plant, or the remains of the nuclear plant, I should say, say their effort to freeze radioactive water in underground tunnels hasn't gone as planned. Tests show the water remains above freezing temperature no matter what they do. TEPCO believes objects in the tunnels are preventing the coolant from spreading evenly. TEPCO also said running wastewater is slowing the process. Then TEPCO said 
It is behind schedule with the scheme because temperature of the pipes sunk into the ground is not low enough. Problem with those pipes, those bad misbehaving pipes. Then TEPCO said today, Tuesday, June 16, that a smaller inner ice wall whose pipes sank earlier to contain the already contaminated water was proving difficult. Bad inner ice wall pipe, bad. TEPCO spokesmodels said, we have yet to form the ice stopper because we can't make the temperature low enough to freeze water. The fifth excuse that TEPCO spokesmodels said, the dog ate it. And as if that wasn't bad enough news, there were two, count them, two earthquakes that hit near Fukushima on Monday, June 15th, a 5.7 and a 5.6. TEPCO said in an email that it had found no anomalies at the site following the quakes. Then again, there are so many anomalies at Fukushima Daiichi, how would they know if there was another 1, 2, or 47 that had shown up? These guys couldn't find an anomaly in their ass with boat hands and a GPS. And in an act of noble futility, shareholders at Japan's nine electric utilities with nuclear power plants have submitted proposals demanding they abolish or reduce their reliance on nuclear energy to generate electricity. It is the first time that shareholders of all the utilities have sought such action. But the proposals are unlikely to lead to major change in policy because the shareholders represent a small number of total shares, the bulk of which are held by financial institutions and other corporate entities, none of which are showing the inclination to back down from nuclear. One more thing. There is a story that has been making the rounds in the past few days about horses dying in Fukushima. The problem is that this recent story of horses dying is a duplicate of the story that was carried on nuclear hot seat number 100, posted on May 14 of 2013. This includes references to the exact same number of deaths among the horses, the new foals that had been born, and the condition of a white mini horse. So folks, let's check the dates on the articles that we are posting and reposting to make certain that they are current. And if they are old, please label them as such. There's enough recent bad news. We don't have to go dipping back into the past to churn up more. Over to the United States, where the collapse of the ecosystem of the Pacific Ocean is happening like a slow motion tsunami of destruction. According to Drew Harville, a marine epidemiologist at Cornell University, it's the largest mortality event for marine diseases we've seen. It affects over 20 species on our coast, and it's been causing catastrophic mortality. In no particular order, starfish are dying by the millions in the grips of a mysterious wasting disease that dissolves their bodies into goo. Sam Anderson, a UC Davis biology, said, we would typically encounter tens of thousands of breeding pairs of pelicans, but there were only sparse numbers. Some nesting sites were alarmingly deserted. Just 1% of the usual number of baby California pelicans have been born. It's nearly a complete failure to breed. There were only 20 newborns in an area where 10,000 were expected. I've never seen anything like it. The Wall Street Journal reported, record numbers of distressed sea lions have washed ashore in California for a second straight year. A record 367 California sea lions have been admitted to the Marine Mammal Center just north of San Francisco, nearly five times the average. The problems may have implications for humans, researchers say. Sea lions are living and feeding on the same resources as humans are. Mark Rayer of Baja California's East Cape region wrote, the bait situation is still very grim with sardines and mackerel nowhere to be found. The Marine Independent Journal stated, we are seeing an issue of availability of oyster seed. There have been complete crashes at these hatcheries. And the Long Beach Telegram on June 13 wrote, the squid boats that net the market squid commercially get an average of six tons nightly. This year, the boats are getting skunked and haven't seen a squid for the last three nights. Lasana Lahner, a veterinarian with the Seattle Aquarium says, it's a signal in the ecosystem that something's not right. 
Others have labeled it truly an extinction level event in slow motion. So what does our federal government have to say about the problems with seafood? In this numb nuts adjacent item, on June 10th, our very own federal officials announced major changes in advice to pregnant and breastfeeding women by recommending consumption of at least eight ounces of low mercury fish per week. No mention of proper radiation levels for optimum health, but hey, that's another subject. The Environmental Protection Agency's Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water, Nancy Stoner, said in a statement, this updated advice will help pregnant women and mothers make informed decisions about the right amount and right kinds of fish to eat during important times in their lives and their children's lives. How about none if it comes from the Pacific Ocean? The EPA's advised new guidelines have pregnant and breastfeeding women being told to eat a minimum of eight ounces, but no more than 12 ounces of fish with low levels of methylmercury. This includes shrimp, pollock, salmon, canned light tuna, tuna, tilapia, catfish, and cod. That's the equivalent of two or three fish servings per week. Young children, according to the advisory, should also have two or three servings of low mercury fish per week, with no word on the radiation levels. As for albacore tuna, known to be swimming through the Fukushima radiation, no more than six ounces a week. After all, this is America. We don't want to kill them off too fast. We need them as cannon fodder. The Michigan State Senate is doing what it can to minimize the impact of nuclear insanity. On Friday, June 13th, always a good luck day, the Senate in that state unanimously passed a bill and series of resolutions that effectively call for a halt to the nuclear waste dump proposed for Kincardine, Ontario, less than a mile from Lake Huron. Senator Phil Pavlov said in a statement, Today's vote shows the Michigan Senate is united in its opposition to this proposed facility. We've heard from residents all across the state about this flawed plan, and it needs to be stopped. Not only would this nuclear dump threaten the health of natural resources in Michigan, it could critically damage the ecosystem of the entire Great Lakes Basin. No word yet as to whether the Canadian government is paying the slightest attention to their neighbors to the south. Another oldie but goodie article has been doing the rounds online, but this one deserves another look. It's from June 21st of 2011 from AP, and it states that radioactive leaks have been found at 75% of U.S. nuclear reactor sites. There will be a link under the links section on our website, nuclearhotseat.com. Go to the blog page and look under this episode, number 156. And an excellent article on the Santa Susana toxic cleanup effort and what a mess it is appeared in the Los Angeles Times on Friday the 13th of June. Somebody's idea of a joke, isn't it? For those of you not familiar with it, the Santa Susana Field Lab is located only 30 miles from downtown Los Angeles in the hills just above Simi Valley. In 1959, it was the site of an experimental nuclear reactor having a partial meltdown that released radiation directly into the environment because it was only in an industrial shell building. There was no containment structure. Even worse, Rocketdyne managed to hide the facts of this accident from the public for 20 years until after Three Mile Island. This will also be up as a link on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under episode number 156. Going international now, in France, Greenpeace has released a report that states that electricity produced by onshore wind and solar plants may become more competitive with power generated by upgraded nuclear plants in that country by the end of this decade. France is planning to cut the share of atomic energy to 50% of its total energy production from the current 75%. They plan to do this by 2025. According to the Greenpeace study, nuclear energy will be less competitive than onshore wind power by around 2015. Hey, that's just next year. However, state-owned utility EDF 
has said that the reactor's lifespan could be extended by 20 years, arguing that their design was based on similar models built by Westinghouse in the United States, where many were granted 60-year licenses. Hey guys, didn't your mother ever teach you that two wrongs do not make a right? Just because we did it here, do you have to try and do it there? Never use the U.S. nuclear industry as a model for anything, except maybe psychosis. It looks like Pakistan may ban Japanese edible items if traces of radioactive material are found on them. What a good idea! In April of 2011, Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority, or PNRA, had directed authorities dealing with cargo arriving directly or indirectly from Japan to screen all types of consignments, including edibles and non-edibles, for radiation. The PNRA made clearance mandatory for every consignment being imported from Japan. Remember, this is Pakistan. We didn't do it here in the U.S., but they did it over in Pakistan. That country's nuclear scientists had advised the federal government three years ago to halt all types of goods from Japan to minimize the threat of radiation following the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. The matter now rests with their Ministry of Food Security and Research to advise the Ministry of Commerce whether to continue import of edible items from Japan or to impose a ban on it. And speaking of imports from Japan, here's this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, not nuts out a week. The Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Hsien Lung, stated he is going to lift all the restrictions on imports from Fukushima Prefecture to Singapore. Singapore has been banning imports of Fukushima vegetables and fruits. But this announcement was made after a meeting between Prime Minister Lung and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Baby. It took place on May 31st. In this extremely manipulative source article from therealsingapore.com, it stated, radioactive isotopes were released from reactor containment vessels as a result of venting to reduce gaseous pressure and the discharge of coolant water into the sea. Where do I even start? Fukushima was not venting. It was exploding. It was melting down. It was releasing tons of radioactive water into the ocean every day. Fukushima was not venting. I'm venting. Fukushima was melting down into the ongoing disaster that it is. Then this lying piece of twisted excuse for journalism had the gall to state, as of early 2013, no physical health effects due to radiation had been observed among the public or Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant workers. That being said, TEPCO and GE do not have a policy that requires them to monitor these supposed effects. Supposed effects? Kids don't count. Kids with thyroid cancer that is now metastasized into their lymph nodes don't count. Masao Yoshida, the head of the Fukushima 50, who died in 2013 of esophageal cancer, he doesn't count. The sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan, who are on an humanitarian aid mission to Fukushima and who are so hit by radiation that they are being crippled and they are dying, they don't count? You genocidal maniacs. Then this article has the gall to state, it is still unknown if there will be any long-term health risk from the effects or consumption of food products from the Fukushima prefecture as long-term studies have not been done. How can you do long-term studies when it's only been three years and the impact of radiation takes at minimum three to five years to show up in leukemia or in thyroid cancer and 12 to 15 years to show up in hard tumors. And that's just the minimum. But of course, no immediate effects, no 
no long-term studies, they will twist this languaging around to justify anything. I'm sure they're getting front row seats at the Tokyo Olympics. And man, I hope this prime minister inhales some of that black dust because man, that's just going to do his lungs exactly the good it needs to do. And that's why Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Hsien Loong, is this week's evil nuclear hot seat. None that's out of week. Speaking of the sailors from the USS Ronald Reagan, they currently have a $1 billion lawsuit against TEPCO for medical expenses. And of course, TEPCO is, no surprise, trying to have the case dismissed. The next court hearing will take place not the date that I announced last week on Nuclear Hot Seat, but it's now set for August 19 at 1.30 p.m. at Federal Court in San Diego. I will have more details when I get them, and all things being equal, I will be down there on that date to cover the story for Nuclear Hot Seat. Before we get into this week's featured interview, I want to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat continues to reach out to people around the world, especially in Japan, with our Voices from Japan series. With our increasing international audience comes increasing bandwidth charges to support all the downloads, plus website charges, security charges, and a whole slew of expenses that must be met to keep this program running. If you have donated before to help us out, many thanks and ongoing gratitude. If you haven't yet donated, or if you'd like to help out once again, just go to nuclearhotseat.com Scroll down on the home page and click on the big red donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear with an attitude. Whatever you can do to help, many thanks. Now for the featured interview. Don Hancock is executive director of Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he has become Nuclear Hot Seat's go-to source on the latest developments at the WIP Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We caught up with Don to get the lowdown on what's been happening since we last spoke with him on Nuclear Hot Seat number 151, five weeks ago. Don, what is the current status at WIP? Give us the overview. The last time any of the workers were able to go underground and their suits to protect them from contamination, including self-breathing apparatus, was May 30th, and that will be the last time they can go underground probably in the entire month of June because right now they're working on the surface to change out the contaminated filters in the surface that filter the air coming out. So they're trying to get the filters changed so they can hopefully ramp up the ventilation system later on so they can get more workers underground so they can do more figuring out what went wrong underground and figuring out what they're going to do about decontamination underground. So things underground are just staying in place at least this month uh, while they're doing these other things. How many other containers have been found from the wake stream of the one container that is known to have exploded? There's one container that they have pictures that's in the underground that clearly has holes in it and has leaked. The Department of Energy says they still need to look for more breach containers when they're able to go back underground in July or wherever that is. I think the evidence is pretty strongly that there has to be more than one breached container. But the, the container that is breached, shows breached, is from a waste stream that there are 54 other containers from that waste stream in the same room in the WIP underground. There are more than 150 of those containers at Waste Control Specialist in Texas, and there are at least 50-some similar containers still at Los Alamos. So as a result of that, uh, at both Los Alamos and Waste Control Specialists, they are taking additional measures to repackage, monitor, check the temperature, and otherwise what's happening with these other containers to try to avoid them being breached, exploding in some way, and to, so trying to 
keep any additional explosions from happening, but also to be prepared with measures to contain it if there are further leaks. But I guess I want to insist upon the fact that we do not know what happened in the underground at WIP. As I say, I'm pretty convinced, and other people who've looked at the data are pretty convinced, that there's got to be more than this one container uh, that has leaked into the WIP underground, and we don't know what caused whatever chemical reaction, to use the Department of Energy term, or explosion, to use the more public term, uh, in terms of what's happening. So, for example, we do not know that the container in the WIP underground that is shown to be breached was actually what caused the breach. In other words, there could be another container nearby that, in fact, caused the breach, and because of its explosion, that forced this other container to leak. So we still don't really know all the major things we need to know about how many containers have leaked, how much have they leaked, what caused the leak in the first place, uh, what kind of decontamination would be necessary, what kind of exposure workers can have in terms of going underground and trying to deal with the situation, among other things. Do you know if Los Alamos is still shipping any of its containers off-site to WCS and Andrews, or have all shipments been frozen for now? All shipments have been suspended since early May from Los Alamos, so what WCS is dealing with are the shipments that went from Los Alamos to WCS before this internal DOE report on May 1st that said there may have been a chemical reaction from one or more containers from Lanol, and so we shouldn't be sending any more Lanol containers to WCS or any place else. Right, and of course, part of the danger there is that WCS is an above-ground facility, so it would be very difficult for them to contain any leaks that would take place. They haven't fully described this, but apparently a few of the containers, maybe as many as five of the containers at WCS have apparently, and this is based on some testimony that the New Mexico Environment Department Secretary Ryan Flynn made a week ago Monday to a New Mexico Legislative Committee, but his understanding was that potentially as many as five of these containers from Los Alamos that is WCS have been taken out of the building that they're in and have actually been put a little bit below ground to try to put it underground for two reasons. One is to keep it from getting so hot because it's very hot in West Texas this time of year, just physical temperature, but also to put it underground to try to contain in case there were some further breach or explosion. Now, as I say, we don't have full details about that yet, but there has been several activities clearly taken at WCS, and as I say, we just don't know what they all are. And any word as to why those five containers are considered to be dangerous enough to take this action with them? According to what the New Mexico Environment Department Secretary said, and again, he's talking second-handed and how well he understands, but what he said is that the one container, this container that's breached at WIP and these five other containers at WCS all have very low pH. In other words, they're very acidic. So one theory, and this, again, is not proven or demonstrated in any way, but one theory is that the containers with high acid content could have helped trigger this kind of chemical reaction. So these five containers at WCS are supposed to be somewhat similar to the container that, as I say, the pictures are shown is breached. That, at least, was the Environment Department Secretary understanding of what's going on. Neither WCS nor the Department of Energy have really provided additional information since last Monday beyond what the New Mexico Environment Department Secretary said. Are the town meetings still taking place every week where the officials are available to the public, to the residents of the area, to be asked? and hopefully to answer the questions and the concerns that they do have. The town hall meetings are no longer every week, so there was not one, for example, last Thursday. There is scheduled to be one this coming Thursday, uh, June the 19th. 
what they announced a couple of weeks ago is that the town hall meetings, rather than being weekly, would just be on the first and third Thursdays of every month. So that's clearly less information. The Department of Energy is no longer even doing daily updates on their website, written updates on their website. So information is still quite hard to come by, and that's a problem that I attribute to the Department of Energy. I guess one other thing that I want to mention kind of related to that, this morning, Tuesday morning, the House Appropriations Committee, the U.S. Congressional House, released a draft report that will be considered by the full Appropriations Committee tomorrow morning in which they, in essence, say, the House committee, in essence, is saying that their understanding is the ventilation system at WIP and the exhaust shaft at WIP are so contaminated that they can never be used again, and therefore, for next year, the House is saying they need to appropriate at least $20 million more to start constructing a new ventilation system and a new exhaust shaft at WIP. Not that that would be nearly enough money to fix those problems, but again, the Department of Energy has not publicly talked about how contaminated the underground and the exhaust shaft are publicly, but clearly they've said some things to at least members of the House of Representatives that lead people in the House to believe that they're not really going to be able to use those parts of the whip anymore. There was an excellent article in the Santa Fe New Mexican that went into great detail. And one of the things that I found particularly disturbing is that it appears that a former employee of Energy Solutions said that the staff tried to warn the company's administrators that the switch in kitty litter was a bad idea. And they cited the science behind that and uh, the combination of nitrate salts and the wheat-based kitty litter created a potentially combustible mix, this is according to the chemist. And yet it went through a long list of approvals, including the Energy Solutions Operation Manager, a subject matter expert, a shift operations manager, and various staff in engineering, quality assurance, and radiation protection. How could such a blind spot exist that nobody had a clue that what they were doing was perhaps not in the best interest of the proper management of the site? The problem of nitrate salts and exploding drums has been known for at least 40 years. Both all of us did a report in 1974 on the subject. It's not an unknown problem, but it's not really a kitty litter problem either as a practical matter. But the answer to your question is we don't know, and there are lots of people who should have known better. There are lots of people, both Los Alamos Energy Solutions, the WIP contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, that is actually responsible for the characterization of the waste at Los Alamos contractually and should have known better. So there, there are a variety of people who should have known better. We don't know what all the problems were. One of the other things that happened yesterday is the internal investigation folks at the Department of Energy notified the WIP contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, they were going to be investigated because of all the problems that we now know, <laughs> and there could be others. So the answer is we don't know who all made mistakes that they shouldn't have made, but it's a wide variety of folks. And if the problem are these one or more containers at Los Alamos, it was more than Energy Solution, more than the Los Alamos contractor, which is called LAND, more than Los Alamos, but also includes Nuclear Waste Partnership. So this is a big problem and we have a long ways to go to know what really happened and we may never know exactly what happened official predictions are that WIP will be closed for in their estimation at least three years in your estimation is that long enough and is that accurate Nobody knows how long it's going to be closed. Uh, what I and other people have called for actually is an independent investigation as opposed to the various internal DOE investigations that are going on. 
because we think this is a very unprecedented situation. Nobody really knows what to do about it, and so we need an independent investigation both to look at what DOE is saying, but to try to determine what actually happened, what can be done about it, whether the facility can be decontaminated completely so it can be reused again, or what the other alternatives are, which would include closing the facility up and not using it anymore. So we don't know. Based on past performance, if it's up to the Department of Energy, they will be very good, and their DOE and their contractors will be very good at spending lots of money and not really solving a problem. I think one of the fundamental things that needs to be looked at is this nuclear waste partnership contractor that I've mentioned that's now being investigated internally by DOE, which is a good thing, although, as I say, in and of itself, it's not going to be enough. The contract that these people have is to operate the facility, not to decontaminate the facility, not to, quote, unquote, recover the facility from the accident, et cetera. So these folks clearly didn't adequately meet their existing contract, and I don't really have confidence that they have the knowledge and expertise and the ability to actually do what else needs to be done. So. If you give the job to folks who can't do it, no matter how much money and how little or much time you say it's going to take, that's not going to be sufficient. One final aspect of this. Even in this report from the Santa Fe New Mexican, the health risk to the 21 WIP employees who were exposed to radiation is still being minimized. Do we have any word on their condition? So it's 22 workers that have been confirmed with internal contamination. They've been confirmed with internal contamination now. Correct. 22 workers have internal contamination. 21 of those were found to have internal contamination through their fecal samples, and an additional worker, the 22nd worker, was found to have internal contamination through urine sampling. All of those people for well over a month, the Department of Energy has said none of those people need to have any additional testing done on them. DOE has not referred any of them to independent medical assessment or treatment, so we actually don't know anything about those workers other than that they were contaminated and DOE has said that the levels of contamination they had were less than 10 millirem and therefore it's not a problem. We don't know what the 22 workers think about that and whether they are or are not seeking some independent medical advice of their own, which I would encourage them to do, frankly. I understand that you are based in Albuquerque, which is some distance away from Carlsbad. If you were living in an area that could be considered downwind of WIP, meaning in proximity to it, what kinds of protective measures would you want to see people taking just in case something else happens at the site? Well, I think the fundamental focus needs what is out, and we don't know how much that is, but what contamination was released of WIP is out. The current monitoring is showing extremely low levels, including non-detect, pretty similar to what was the case before February of this year. So the focus needs to be on preventing anything else from happening and preventing workers at the site from getting further contamination. That's where my concern is, regardless of how close or how far away it is. I am concerned about the 22 workers. I am concerned about the workers who go underground. I'm concerned about the workers who are trying to replace the filters because they're in quite close proximity to a significant amount of contamination in those filters. I think there is a lot of focus that needs to be on those things. As I say, I also believe independent medical and other people should be brought in to look at the situation and recommend changes in terms of how things are going so that people who are living in proximity can be more assured that further events are not going to happen. But at this point, there are still risks of additional events happening. Anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered? There's always more to talk about, but thank you for your continuing interest in this important subject, which is going to keep going on and on and on for quite some time.
and Nuclear Hot Seat will be right there with him getting all the news and passing it along to you. That was Don Hancock, Nuclear Watchdog and Executive Director of the Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're posting a link to a source for the interview, a really well done article from the Santa Fe New Mexican written by reporter Stacy Matlock. It will be up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under episode 156. So what does it mean to find yourself accidentally in proximity to a nuclear accident? Say, a leaking nuclear reactor like Three Mile Island. That's my personal story, and I tell it in my nuclear memoir, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. It's available as an ebook on Amazon Kindle. You can check out a free excerpt by going to my website, nuclearhotseat.com, and in the big yellow box, just put in your first name and your email address, and you'll receive by email a PDF from the chapter. It takes me from landing at Harrisburg Airport five days before the nuclear accident began to being trapped in my friend's house after evacuation was announced by a bullhorn, only I had no way to evacuate. Lots of fun, light reading. Hey, activist shout out, John Stewart. You know me. You can feel my vibe. I still dream of becoming and intend to become John Stewart's nuclear pundit. If a comedy show can't handle the nuclear issue, what can? So John, Bobby, get ready. You need a nuclear numbnuts of the week and I can create it for you. No, I'm not it. The news would be it. All I ask is the chance. The Daily Show needs me. You need me. John, call me. Send me your number. I'll call you. We'll talk. Here's today's final thought, but it's not really final. It's really my version of an anniversary party. Today marks the third anniversary of Nuclear Hot Seat and the start of our fourth year. I literally could not have imagined the journey this show has taken me on and what it took to get me here. I look back over the first three years, and here are a few brief highlights you may not have heard, because man, for the longest time, I was impossible to find. When I first got the impulse to do Nuclear Hot Seat, I posted on Facebook just once, a little status update, asking if there was anyone who would want to get on a call with me to learn more about nuclear issues. Now, realize, I was not a known activist. I hadn't been an activist between Three Mile Island and Fukushima, except for some feeble attempts that I made immediately thereafter. Couldn't hack it. Nobody knew me. I was just this person who had once been somewhere really bad and had an obsession to share what I knew with others. So as a result of this little post I did once on Facebook, amazingly enough, two people showed up on the call, one of whom I didn't even know. Now, I called it a podcast, but it was really just a conference call, until now heard only by the three of us who were on that call. So this is how the nuclear hot seat journey began. Well, I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm going to... Okay, okay. here we go, guys. Um, okay. My name is Libby Halevi, and we are talking on Tuesday, June 14th, 2011. And uh, the purpose of this call is to discuss the nuclear issues that are going on in the world. Um, I have a particular interest in this because I uh, was at Three Mile Island when it happened. I was one mile away. That was back in 1979. And ever since, I have been acutely aware of what's going on with, with the nuclear industry. Maybe not completely conversant. There are times I avoided the information completely. But certainly since Fukushima on March 11th of this year, uh, I have been absorbed in what's going on, the information that's out there, the various ramifications it's having, the lack of information that is getting to most people, and what it is that we need to do in order to maintain our health, maintain our sanity, and do something to turn around a nuclear situation so that we're no longer being um, subjected to the dangers of having a dirty bomb in our backyard. Um, there are a lot of directions I could go with this, 
but I think where I would like to focus is to let you know that this is about sparking an activist response. Um, a lot of times online we get all excited and we sign petitions and we forward videos and we say, oh, look at this, oh, isn't this, isn't this upsetting, oh, isn't this terrible? And then it all dies down and goes away and nothing has translated into action in the analog world, in the physical world. It's just been a brouhaha online. So what I would like to do is address this from a perspective of what can we do to take action, small steps leading to larger steps that can put an activist response into the world so we can start turning this thing around. Great sound quality, don't you think? For the first several weeks that I produced, my only caller was Tim Smith, who was on this call. And I want to thank him for that, because without him, there would have been really stupid free conference call music in the background, and I couldn't have even recorded. Then in August of 2011, I attended a California statewide organizing meeting for anti-nuclear activists. This took place up in San Francisco. As my horizons and contacts expanded, so did some of my challenges. I quickly learned that some people give a cleaner audio interview than others. So I began recording and then editing the interviews, the audio equivalent of a nip and tuck procedure to improve the audio flow. I still do that. Every week, I do what I can to remove irrelevant verbal tics to make my interviewees and their information sound as good and as accessible as possible. Here is a mere sprinkling of edits, not meant to embarrass anyone, just to be a brief representation of some of the stuff you don't get to hear every week. And of course, I do not spare myself at all. So there are a number of choice morsels that I've managed to outtake through the years. Um, uh, uh, um. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, um. Uh. <clears throat> uh. Here. Here. Hero. 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 Coid. Um. Uh. You know the. 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 Hero. I. Coid. Coid. Um. I hate this story. I hate this story. I hate this story. Um. Um. Lori Mokizuchi. So. Uh, no. Mm. You know. Come on, darling, you can do this. <laughs> How many times do I have to do this? The, uh, these, um... Fuck, 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 fuck it! Uh, um... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, um... Blah, blah, blah. Oh, God, do it again. Hirowake Kawide. Hirowake Kawide. Phew! A mere sampling of what you don't hear every week on Nuclear Hot Seat. And some of you accuse me of never swearing. Ha! By the way, that one name in the middle that I butchered was actually Iori Mochizuki. At the end of my first program, Nuclear Hot Seat won from June 14, 2011. I stated my vision for the chef, something that I hold to still and that I recommit to every Tuesday. It's been scary being alone with this and not being able to engage in the conversation, and that stopped me from taking action. And um, you've just helped me alleviate the part that had me stuck. So here's two more action, and um, let's start turning this around. One tiny action at a time, but if we all take it, it's amazing what we'll be able to do. You did a beautiful job, Lee. Thank you. I'm actually going to post a link for this as soon as I figure out how to do that. <laughs> Me and my techie, my, my, my boomer techie what I, uh, uh, behavior. By the way, I figured out how to post that link. As I head into the fourth year of weekly production on Nuclear Hot Seat, know that I remain dedicated to providing you with the best, most up-to-date, and verifiably accurate information on the nuclear issue in all its forms. I've been helped by some splendid people along the way. All of my interviewees, whose expertise I both cherish and revere. 
Beverly Findlay Kaneko, who co-produces the Voices of Japan series and provides Japanese translations. Kathy Awani and Carol Hisasawa, who have also provided translations, as well as support and encouragement. Joni Ray, who puts together the videos for the Nuclear Hot Seat video channel, and Sean Arklight, who helps me so consistently get the word out on Tuesday nights on social media. Too many individual activists to mention by name, all of whom have helped me understand the issues and whose posts on the list serves have helped me find some of my snarkier observations. The incredibly dedicated Facebook nuclear hot seat community from whom I gleaned so much spectacular insight. And all of you who listen, send me email, donate to support the work. It's been quite an amazing ride in great company, doing something fulfilling that maybe, just maybe, has a chance of making a difference. I have a lot of plans for Nuclear Hot Seat this year. I'm expanding international coverage and have some exciting interviews already lined up. I'll include more coverage on nuclear weapons, as if we don't have enough to worry about with nuclear energy. I'm going after more music, comedy, and performances of all kinds to keep we the activists in good heart. I'm working with some tech wizards to spiff up my social media work. Much more can be done to get the word out, and I'm planning to learn how to do it. And a big important goal this year is to again attend the Excellence in Journalism Conference where mainstream media news directors, reporters, and syndicators gather to talk shop, make connections, and if I'm there, learn about the nuclear issues they are not yet covering, whether they want to or not. Last year, that conference was held just down the freeway from me in Anaheim, California. This year, it's in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's going to take a bit of fundraising to cover airfare, hotel registration, and, oh yeah, food, a girl's got to eat. The Excellence in Journalism Conference is being held September 4th through 6th, and I need to sign up by July 23rd to get the early bird rates. So if you've ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat and want to target your funds, this would be a great way to do it. Know that all things being equal, I'm not going away anytime soon. After all, if plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years, I've got plenty of time to stick around. Till that's gone dead and cold, I won't be running out of targets to report on and or lampoon. I just wonder, what do other people do with their Tuesdays? I know what I do with mine, produce this show. Thanks for joining me on the journey. Stay tuned for more from my heart to yours. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 17, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, ecowatch.com, evacuatefukushimanow.wordpress.com, NHK, Japan Times, Dissensus Japan, Asahi Shimbun, NHK World, nuclearnews.net, naturalnews.com, Pete Thomas Outdoors, Wall Street Journal, Marin Independent Journal, Long Beach Press Telegram, McLean's, KUOW News, VoiceNews.com, CBSNews.com, The Los Angeles Times, EcoWatch.com, Santa Fe, New Mexican, Reuters.com, Greenpeace, The Nation, TheRealSingapore.com, Patui, 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 World Nuclear News, Patui, 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 and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Please stop by on our page, say hello, click a couple of likes, be our friend. Thanks always to Beverly Finlay Kaneko for again providing information from Japan. You are a great partner. Also, my gratitude to Mike Fluke of RadiationPrevention.com for his ongoing assistance with the website. Man, do we ever have something neat planned for you. The theme music is written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weaver. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY-TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. We are also appearing on airamerica.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can get it under podcasts and also on our newly searchable website, nuclearhotseat.com. We're on the blog page. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. 
You have my permission to reuse this material for nonprofit use as long as proper attribution is included. If you're a for-profit, drop me an email and let's talk. We're reasonable. This is Lee B. Halevi of Heart of Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.